Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, whatever time zone you are listening from. I'm pleased to welcome you, all our Zoom and Facebook viewers, to our 20th webinar of the Mexican Institute of Water Technology, Espacio del Conocimiento en Línea webinar series. We are very happy today. We have over 240 attendees, and we have a special viewer, Angel Carrizales from the Security, Energy, and Environment Agency from Mexico. Today's webinar is titled Large-Scale Quantification of Karstic Groundwater Research and Contamination Risk to Inform International Water Policy. My name is Mauricio and I will be your host today. Before introducing our speaker, I'd like to give you some key messages. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them on Zoom's chat room or if you're watching from Facebook Live, please do so on the comment box. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation where we will try to answer as many as possible. Also, all webinars are recorded and available soon afterwards on our social media shown on your screen. So please make sure to follow us if you want to watch again this presentation or any other of the webinar series. So now, Agustin Breña, the head of the hydrology department, will read a short bio to introduce our speaker. Go ahead, Agustin. Good morning, everyone. Um, so um, today we have a uh, and uh, an expert on gas hydrology giving us um, a lecture on his work, mostly on uh, groundwater modeling with a focus on gas uh, systems. So um, uh, I'm introducing Dr. Andreas Harman. Um, he's um, currently junior professor and chair of hydrological modeling and water resources at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, he's an expert in large scale hydrological modeling uh, with a focus on, on gas aquifers, like I said before. Um, prior to his current academic appointment, he was a postdoc at the University of Bristol and McGill University, working with two, uh, two of, the, of the most um, uh, important and recognized hydrologists in, in this field, uh, Thorsten Wagner and Tom Gleason. And before his postdoc, he, um, his academic back, background uh, is in hydrology, both uh, obtained at the University of Freiburg. Uh, he has been a recipient of the following, following prizes. Uh, the, the most recent is the Arne Richter Award for Outstanding Early Career Scientist from the European Sciences Union. Um, he also received in the, the Groundwater Research, Research Prize of the city of Dresden in Germany and, and the Jim Dusch Award for Best uh, 2012 Publication in hydro, Hydrology and Earth, Science, uh, and Earth Systems Sciences, also in 2013. Um, he was Associate Editor of the Journal of Hydrology in 2016 and 2017, and he, he's, he has been a journal referee for more than 12 peer-reviewed journals, including um, Nature Climate Change, uh, right now, he's leading the GLOBE project. Uh, this is the acronym for Global Assessment of Water Stress in Karst Regions in a Changing World. That is, uh, this is a, a project funded by the German Research Foundation. And he, he has published so far uh, 36 uh, scientific papers that have been cited uh, more than 1,200 uh, 1, times. And he has an H index of uh, 19. So um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harman, for this interesting talk. As you know, uh, Mexico has um, uh, a substantial proportion of, of karst aquifers, mostly in, in the south, uh, in the southeast part of Mexico, in Yucatan. So I think this uh, this talk will be uh, very uh, inter interesting for for the audience. Uh, thank you. Dr. Hartman, the audience and the screen is yours. Okay. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And um, Dr. Brenya forgot to mention that actually during my PhD in Freiburg, um, he was also there doing his PhD. So we know each other for quite a long time. And that's why I'm especially very excited to give the talk today um, with you. Also, if it's just online, um, it's a big pleasure for me. So as already introduced um, by, uh, <coughs> By, by you before, my topic of research is um, karst, most specifically karst modeling, but you will see it's also a little bit of fieldwork, and I'm more and more growing towards the larger scale. So this figure shows um, a region that is 
heavily irrigated by um, by groundwater. It's the Central Valley in the United States, and it was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, Dr. Harman, you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's. Give me a second. Yeah, no problem. I forgot that I have to do it actively. Okay, <laughs> once again. <laughs> yes. Okay, so and please also remind me to stop sharing if I forget. Okay, yeah, yeah. so Thank you, you should much. now all see my screen. Thanks a lot for the um, reminder and, um, and my apologies for the, um, the delay. Okay, so what you see now, that is um, the Central Valley in the United States. In the background, you see um, a lot of irrigation devices um, fed from groundwater. And this photo was part of a um, blog contribution about increasing well depths and groundwater use for irrigation in the United States. Generally, <clears throat> groundwater is quite important as it is the largest source of um, non-frozen fresh water in the world. And it's supplying, estimates say that it's applying about half of the world population with drinking water. So as you might understand a quantitative understanding of these systems is highly important. First of all, for water management in general, but also for civil engineering in terms of building wells or building constructions that have to be on a safe ground. Um, in terms of pollutant management, which I will include in my talk a little bit later. In terms of hydrology, because streams are fed from groundwater during dry periods and ecology, because many ecosystems depend on groundwater. Of course, this is not new, and many people did a lot of groundwater research for hundreds of years, but most of this research has been done on a um, scale that is more or less the scale of an aquifer, so the groundwater, like single groundwater systems. However, in the last um, decade, I would say, or the last couple of years, there was an emerging trend towards large-scale groundwater assessment, um, most of all driven by the need to understand how climate and climate change interacts with groundwater. This global map on the right, it shows how groundwater recharge is, is expected to change in the years 41 to 70 in this century um, compared to 1961 to 1990 in the last century. And you see like these are the percentages of change. Um, other research considered the general feedbacks between groundwater and the rest of the earth system. So hydrology, ecology, and so forth. It is also important to, um, <clears throat> to inform policy of larger regions, like at the European level, at the national level, at the global level, um, especially when we have transboundary groundwater systems. And this becomes more and more important in a more and more globalized world. And overall, it's also important to inform local and global populations about groundwater, its availability, and the threats it's facing right now or it will face in the future. So as you can imagine, in these large scales, <clears throat> there are not so many measurements available. So most of the presently available large-scale groundwater assessment methods, they rely on large-scale simulation tools. And as you might also um, imagine, um, all of you that work with models, um, these um, simulation tools are strongly simplified representation of groundwater systems and the simplification becomes much worse when you go to larger scales. Also at larger scales, there are a lot of regions that are simulated by those tools where there's actually no data available to parameterize the simulation tools or to evaluate them. So more and more, when you think about these like large-scale models and, as, um, and them being applied on the entire land surface, you get the idea that maybe in some regions, these tools are not really reliable. <clears throat> so this is a cross-section through the Middle East. So it's not Europe, as it's just a nice cross, a geological cross-section that I found that shows a lot of different landscapes. You see um, <clears throat> snowy mountains, you see um, some groundwater flow towards the valleys into regional aquifers. Um, there can be water flow that enters from the surface into the groundwater after being um, discharged um, on the surface. There can be local aquifers, there can be carbonate rock aquifers, and there can be some exchange between the sea and the groundwater. And when you think about these modeling tools, how would it ever be possible to include like all of these different processes 
only of this like little cross section, and you know there are much more complex systems and different systems all around the globe into large scale models. So an emerging trend to adding to this groundwater, large scale groundwater assessment is um, the more and more ideas about how to trust simulation of large scale um, hydrological tools at these different landscapes. And that brings us more and more towards what I have been doing in the last couple of years. So my research focus, as um, Augustine already um, told, the, um, told you, is the um, hydrology of karst regions. Karst develops through the dissolution, chemical dissolution of carbonate rock. So it's basically this area that I'm looking at. And um, this looks not very spectacular, but I have some more photos for you. So these are also karst regions. Um, this is the scenery where the last Hong Kong and um, Hong Kong, I, last King Kong movie was shot. Um, it's um, some island in close to Thailand. That's a very famous cave in um, in Bulgaria where Sylvester Stallone is, um, landed his plane in in the Expendables 2. This is the uh, um, Astor window um, in Malta, south of Spain, where they shot um, parts of um, Game of Thrones. And this is actually close to very, very close to one of my study sites. It's in Puerto Rico, one of the largest radio telescopes in the world, where James Bond had his final fight with the evil villain in, in Goldfinger. And uh, was it Gold? Gold? Goldfinger, I think it was. Uh, it was at least one of the James Bond movies, and it was on top here. So um, cast regions, and they are present in the, in the movies, and they are all present in our lives, also in Mexico. And they develop as I said already, through the carbon network dissolution and the feedback with hydrology. Because it, water brings acids and acids dissolve the rock. And if there's more place for water to pass through, it can bring in even more acids. So that's a positive feedback. It widens the fissures. It creates caves and conduits. And we end up with these beautiful landscapes. Many people ask me whether there's a clear definition about cars, and in fact, there is not. Just recently, in 2017, there was a paper that discusses the varying definition of cars. Um, for me, cars is just something where water can flow quickly and slowly at the same time, as you will see in two or three slides. There's also some relevance for cars. So as I'm from Europe, I, sorry, I only have this for Europe at the present. In Europe, um, cars covers around a quarter of the land surface and it's home of about a third of its population. And countries like um, Austria or Slovenia receive almost half of its um, drinking water supply from carbonate rock aquifers. So this is the fraction of carbonate rock water to net total national water supplies. This is a fraction of carbonate rock outcrops. And um, most interestingly um, is um, the country of Aust Austria, where the entire capital, Vienna, is um, fed by a large cast aquifer. Globally, around a quarter of the world population is fully or partially dependent on water from cast aquifers. So concerning the groundwater in total that provides half of the water supply to the world population, cast provides a substantial part of this groundwater. So coming back to the fast flow pass, this is um, a schematic view or cross section of a cast system, how it might look like. And I won't go through all these different processes. The only thing that I want to show you here that water can always take two ways. It can infiltrate slowly through cracks and fissures, or it can infiltrate rapidly through door lines, funnels, or larger cracks. Then it can flow through the unsaturated zone, through the small cracks and fissures, or it can take the fast way, the shortcut, through the conduit network that developed through to the cast and through the cast dissolution. And the same happens also in the groundwater. You can have fast flow through the caves and slow flow through the rock matrix. So overall, there are basically shortcuts everywhere for the water and also for transport. So if you look at typical modeling approaches, and for those who do not model, it's, there are some like typical equations that you usually apply in your simulation models. And two of them are the Richards equation and Darcy equation. Darcy is very important for groundwater. And you might imagine that these equations are not directly applicable in the karst. 
So um, to understand and to develop better modeling approaches that can account for these fast flow processes, we first have to understand what does actually do these shortcuts do to water flow and transport. And I brought you a little example for that. This is shown here. So this is a very simplified car system. <clears throat> the bottom one, which is called average permeability, is just a block of fissured rock that doesn't have a shortcut. Then on the top, the dual permeability, it's the same block of fissured rock, but it has a shortcut like a cast conduit. And when you apply just two, like let's say two sim single rainfall events to these two blocks, you can actually get under certain conditions, the same reaction in terms of discharge. So these two um, precipitation events, they would produce a double peak and a recession and the average permeability and the dual permeability, the orange and the green line, would produce more or less the same results. Um, the circles are just some um, hypothetical observations. And I also plotted for the dual permeability the fraction of water that goes through this little conduit. And you see it's quite tiny in the, um, in, in the sketch that I'm showing, but the fraction of water that passes through this little conduit, because of its high permeability, it's around a third of the total flow. So now, if the conditions would change, let's say through climate change, we would have the same volume of precipitation, but it would come in more intense um, rates. So like that. So the curve on the, the area under the curve here is the same like in the upper figure, but it's just a higher intensity. And you apply the same um, two subsurface representations. You will see that the preferential flow increases substantially, it's almost half of the um, total flow, and the peaks are much more pronounced if there is a fast flow path, and the recession is much, not much, but it's a little bit stronger than the average permeability. So um, there could be conditions where you could actually not recognize the shortcuts in this example B shown here, but if there is a change of boundary conditions, let's say of the climate, then you might actually see strong differences. And the most important thing that is affected is the preferential flow and the transport. We will come back to this later at the continental scale. So yeah, first of all, we have to think about how to model this as all. So that was what I have been doing for a long time. So I developed different modeling approaches for the unsaturated, the radius zone of cast systems, I sometimes used very simple equations of the subsurface, which are these bucket types models. Sometimes um, me or other colleagues used more, more explicit and mechanistic approaches that usually work on the spatially distributed M resolution. The same is also true for groundwater. So you can simulate classic groundwater by simple boxes that represent the slow and the fast flow paths or you can also go for a spatially explicit simulation. So this is the same karst system chips um, viewed um, from above, and these are the little doll lines. And you could model the entire aquifer by considering the slow matrix flow in a grid, where you could apply the Stasi equation, and you insert the karst cave network as discrete fissures, where you can have turbulent flow and, and fast flow conditioned, and they are somehow in some sort of exchange with each other. So um, you can basically simulate caustic system in various degrees of complexity, but you need to have the data. That brings us a bit more to um, the studies that I want to show you today. So um, what I did, which was um, <clears throat> a bit indicated already before, is that I used these different modeling approaches for, this, um, for the cast radius zone and for the caustic groundwater. Um, but the special thing about me is I use them at strongly different scales. So during my PhD, while um, Dr. Benya was still in Freiburg, I worked at the plot scale and I tried to simulate groundwater recharge sometimes for single caves or just for a single aquifer. And then in, in my times as a postdoc in Bristol and in, in Montreal, I, I came more and more to model the large behavior, large scale behavior of caste system at the continental scale. And actually now with my research group, I'm working at the global scale. So how could this transition be possible? 
And there are two very good examples to show that, and I will actually show them in parallel. One of them is the study already mentioned by um, Dr. Benya, which, I, um, which was awarded with the Duge Award for the best publication in 2012. That is the simulation of groundwater recharge at the plot scale where I actually looked at a single cave, which is shown in the next slide. And the other um, publication was my first publication on the large scale simulation of groundwater recharge, where we looked at Europe and the Mediterranean, um, <clears throat> which was also recognized as an EGU research highlight. So let's look at these two different scales a bit more closely. At the plot scale study, I had a plot of just several hundreds of square meter, but I had a lot of information and observations about percolation rates because there was a cave 30 meters below the ground. And at this cave, um, they were monitoring the drip rates and also the concentration of artificial trace experiments that were applied on the top. Generally, it was quite well understood, and there were already two preceding studies that characterized the system. So for a cast system, this is, was really, really good. On the other hand, there's a continental scale study, and the simulation domain are, in fact, all these bright blue regions that are shown here. These are the carbonate rock regions over Europe. But instead of having a lot of observations at one point, I had just few observations at these orange and green dots, which were um, flux net, latent heat flux observations. So it's basically evap observed evapotranspiration and observed soil moisture. Both of them were international networks that provided the data freely. And I just took those stations that were located inside carbon network regions. So compared to the plot scale study, you would also agree that this is rather poorly understood. So how did I approach the simulation of these two um, different domains? I developed models, of course. The plot scale model, a model would be classified as a processed oriented model. So it's not completely spatially distributed, but it has a way of integrating spatial heterogeneity by distribution functions. These are indicated by this like shape-like structure here. So um, the structure indicates that different soil thicknesses, different epicast thicknesses are considered. And since I had a lot of data available at different points and different observation variates, I could apply multivariate model calibration, sensitivity analysis, and I could actually, I had enough data to falsify um, wrong model structures. So in fact, this was the result of testing a lot of different model structures and combinations of them. And, and all of them were discarded except for this one. At the continental scale, the model looks actually quite similar, but in terms of process reputation, it's much more parsimonious. It only has four parameters compared to 13 parameters of the process-oriented model, but it's applied on a grid. So this um, rectangular red trapezoidal is applied on all these grid cells that cover an um, entire cast region. Um, since I didn't have observation at each of these grid cells. I had to develop a new regional parameter estimation procedure that accounts for all the uncertainty that we are facing um, when working on this larger scale. And there was no way of falsifying different model structures because the data availability was just too little. So um, this was the only model that we tried and we just um, believed it's not a bad choice because it's based on the conceptual understanding that was developed before on the catchment and on the plot scale. So summarizing, these approaches are quite differently, but they have the same representation of the subsurface heterogeneity by distribution functions, just different degrees of detail. Let's look at the results. These are the results of the plot scale model. On the upper um, row, you see this, the observed vertical percolation rates of all these different drips that were located in the cave. So you see they were behaving a little bit differently, all of them. This is one of like, I think that was a trace experiment. So it's not a rainfall event. It was a, 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 a sprinkling event and that was artificial, but it's, it's also an observed reaction. And this is the normalized concentration of the tracer that was applied during this experiment. And it's also like a different reaction for all of these different um, drips that were monitored in the cave. And down here, you see the simulation of the model. And as the model reflects the spatial heterogeneity by this distribution function, it also creates a variability of different reaction to these um, 
sprinkling experiments and to the trace experiment. And these we could show were quite realistic in terms of spatial variability, in terms of temporal dynamics. We could also perform um, a split sample test to show that this model is providing robust and realistic predictions. So let's look at the continental scale. <clears throat> these are the mean annual recharge volumes that were obtained by the model. And for those who don't see it, like the scale is down here. So dark blue means it's equal or larger than 1,000 millimeters per year. And dark orange or red means that there's zero millimeters per year. The model was operating on a daily resolution, but um, it was um, parameter were estimated only on the monthly resolution. So I would never trust this model at a time um, resolution that fine as at the plot scale, which was on a six hour resolution. Um, but I would say the model can reflect the monthly variation. But how much would I trust this model? So how much would this model actually reflect on a large scale the behavior of carbon network regions? For that, we did um, an evaluation that was not as strict as the one for the plot scale model, but it was at least a twofold evaluation, which is shown here. What we did first, we, we compared this simulation model to a large scale simulation model that has already been applied a lot for um, global hydrological studies. And if you see a nature publication about groundwater um, decline, the groundwater footprint, or the latest paper from Gleason et al., uh, which was um, about pumping effect on stream flow on a global scale, this was all done with this PCR Globe WB model. So it's a widely applied model from a group in Utrecht. Um, Mark Birkins and Yoshi Wada are those who are working a lot with it. And we looked at the simulation of this model and of this model at locations where we could also find observations of groundwater recharge from literature review. This is shown in that figure. <clears throat> so on the x-axis, you see the observed recharge that we extracted from literature review. And the y-axis shows the stimulated recharge for these locations of the different models. You see a huge spread for all of them because you have all these like scaling problems because these models work on a 0 0.25 decimal degree grid and these observations, they are sometimes local, they are sometimes aquifer scale. So of course there's a lot of um, scatter, but when you look at the general simulations, you find that the non-carstic, the PCR Globe WB model tends to a strong underestimation of groundwater recharge. While the CARS model still like over and underestimating groundwater reaches on average actually gets it much, much better. So this gave us some indication that the process representation, including the cast processes in the cast model, actually provides more realistic results. When we had this paper in review, one of the reviewers um, claimed that we cannot be sure that actually the cast processes are the reason for the difference of these two models. So to convince that reviewer, we turned off the cast process in the model, meaning we did not allow any more for concentrated recharge, but more surface runoff. So here you see the surface runoff in the original um, structure of the model is almost not abundant because everything can infiltrate into these like enlarged cracks and fissures, which are the shortcuts. And if you turn this off, you will have more surface runoff and you will get very, very close to the simulations provided by the other large scale recharge model, which also creates a lot of surface runoff instead of groundwater recharge. We could also prove statistically there's no significant difference anymore between the green and the orange simulations, but there's a significant difference between the blue and the green or the blue and the orange simulations. So with that, we were, some, we were a little bit confident that we could actually use the model for something useful. So we coupled it with um, climate projections, which were the CMIP-5 um, model ensembles. We, we used five of them <clears throat> and we run groundwater recharge simulation up to the end of this century. And we continued with the comparison of the karstic and the non-karstic models, which is shown in those figures. So um, the, the simulation domain was divided into four different sub-regions. For all of those, we determined our parameter sets. And you see in these figures, um, you see the development of groundwater recharge for the non-casting model and for the casting model, which is always on top. And um, which first of all shows this, this difference between the two models. So the underestimating of, of groundwater recharge by the global non-casting model persists 
to the future. You can also see for all these different regions, the humid region, mountain region, Mediterranean region, desert region, that both models predict a, a decrease of groundwater recharge. But in terms, which is not so different in terms of relative change, but it's quite substantial in terms of absolute volumes. What you can also see, um, when you look closely, you see that the CARS model, it provides an estimate of simulation uncertainty, which is the dashed line around the thick medium line, um, which is here. So here you see that the dashes are very close to the simulation, to the mean simulation, which means the model uncertainty is actually not so big and the change that the model predicts is much larger than the uncertainty. The same you find for the mountain region. You see that the dashed lines are very close to the mean simulation and <clears throat> the predicted change is much, much larger. If you look at the Mediterranean region, because of more temporal variability and because of less observations, higher uncertainty in the model, the dashed lines are not that close anymore to the sim mean simulation, but they are still closer than the predicted change. So in the Mediterranean region, even though the uncertainty is much, much larger, <clears throat> there would be still enough um, precision to, make a, to draw some conclusion. But if you look at the desert region, we see that the simulation uncertainty, which is here and here, is much larger than the predicted change of just 7%. <clears throat> And that means in those regions that are actually <coughs> most vulnerable to climate change, <coughs> we have the lowest precision of our model, which is due to the low um, availability of, the, of observation in those regions. So we think this is, was a quite useful result. We went for another application, which already brings us toward the direction of <coughs> groundwater contamination risk assessment, which was the application of the model to um, predict the stable isotopic composition observed in karstic caves all around the globe. For those caves, <clears throat> my colleagues and I showed that when you compare the isotopic composition of rainfall and the, the one of drip water, you actually find a strong bias um, <clears throat> towards, um, towards more depleted values. So, um, which is quite relevant if, um, for, um, for scientists that <coughs> reconstruct paleoclimatic conditions because they always assume that the rainfall amounted oxygen 18 amount equals the drip water amount. When we used my model at those locations to correct the, um, the rainfall for its seasonality, we could get a much better fit of isotopic composition <coughs> in the cave and so we could actually show, which was due to the seasonality of groundwater recharge, which was mostly taking place in winter. And that's why they observed groundwater, uh, drip water, isotopic composition had this strong bias towards winter precipitation. And the model was able to correct that, <coughs> which actually means that in some regions, which are mostly arid and semi-arid regions with a strong seasonality, there is, in addition to the climatic signal, there's also a hydrological signal in the paleoclimatic archives which is quite interesting for future research. But generally, we could also, in this case, we could show that the model, the large scale model was useful to improve local analysis. So let's think about water quality. In the previous study, <clears throat> I showed that groundwater recharge is mostly underestimated by large scale groundwater models, which is wood, <clears throat> which would generally be, a, first of all, a good, um, good news for water management because it means <clears throat> there's actually more drinking water available. It's not so relevant for groundwater management at the local scales because usually local water management, meant they know about what's available, <clears throat> but for water policy, which relies on models like PCR Globe WB, that means actually there is a bit more water available than they actually thought. But is this water really usable? And that brings us to the water quality issue. <clears throat> if we look at a strongly agriculturally used region, we would, um, this region would um, experience um, the application of pesticides, the application maybe of manure, which might include some um, pathogens like E. coli 
or also a menu might include pharmaceuticals um, that are given to the animals to make them stronger and more, um, more resistive against um, diseases. And all this stuff <coughs> is brought to the agricultural fields. So if we have a system, as I showed before, a caste system, this might um, infiltrate into the subsurface much faster than expected because there are these shortcuts to the groundwater. So instead of decomposing um, after some time, these contaminants might actually reach the groundwater. And if the, the groundwater is also flowing rapidly, it might actually get to the drinking water supply. So in my most recent work, we looked at how fast water can actually travel from the surface to the subsurface again at the continental scale. This was done by three simple steps. So the entire idea or the general idea was to compare travel times of groundwater recharge with the half-life times of degradable pollutants. <clears throat> travel times were derived by virtual ex trace experiments, which is an approach that Marcus Weiler and Jeff McDonald already developed um, in 2004. And I already applied this in some karst regions in the local or at the catchment scale. And then to actually evaluate whether this makes um, sense, the travel time distributions that were derived by the virtual JAX experiments were um, translated into rapid recharge fractions that correspond to water volumes of fractions of recharge <coughs> that are younger than a certain predefined threshold. And those could be compared with observations of young water fractions that were derived from, car, from more than 100 car springs where they, this data was available um, by water isotopic measurements. And the way how to translate water isotopic measurements in discharge to young water fraction data method that was developed by my colleague, Scott Jarseko and Jim Kirchner at ETH Zurich. Um, Scott was also a collaborator in this study or still is. So um, what are the results? This is the map that shows the simulated fraction of recharge that is 90 days or younger over the entire simulation domain of the continental recharge model. And you see that the more you go south into this Mediterranean and arid region, you have high, larger fractions of total recharge that are actually younger than these 90 days. Also, we did the evaluation with the observed groundwater, um, observed fraction of young water, and we find that there is some sort of like bias, but they are not so far away from a, um, from a line. <laughs> so actually the spread is smaller than um, the spread that we found for the observed groundwater recharge rate. And we have some overestimation of simulated rapid recharge fractions for, um, for, uh, for the Mediterranean and for, uh, for the mountain and for the, um, for the humid region. But it makes sense because we compare it with the um, young water fraction of groundwater discharge. So the model does not <coughs> include transport in the groundwater. It just in, in includes groundwater <coughs> and transport to the groundwater, but not um, the lateral flow to the karstic springs. So an overestimation of rapid recharge fractions by the model compared to the observation could have been expected. And this is what we find down here. So actually, we get a, um, a feeling that <coughs> at least for this 90-day threshold, it didn't work so bad. We also tried it for the 60-day threshold and it looked very similar. So um, we went for um, an assessment of groundwater risk, which was done or which is shown in this figure. Um, so as I said, um, I could basically use these travel time distributions um, derived from artificial trace experiment to, for any given threshold. <clears throat> so I used 60 and 90 days because that allowed me to um, compare the rapid recharge fractions with the young water fractions that we could derived from observations. But inside the model, I could also define a five-day threshold, a 90-day threshold, a 60-day threshold, and so forth. And this is shown here. So I define these different thresholds up to 90 days. I run the model again for these like four different subregions, which are shown in these lines. And you again <clears throat> see how for the different um, regions, the young water fraction increases with the increasing threshold. So um, when we go back to the 90 days, <clears throat> and we are here in the Mediterranean, we see that <clears throat> in the Mediterranean, we get sometimes rapid recharge fraction more than 60%. And if you look at the other regions, the 
desert region, the humid region, mountain region, we go up maybe to 20, 30%. Then we did the same thing as we did in the study of groundwater recharge at the continental scale. We turned off concentrated recharge and we derive much smaller fraction of ground of, of, um, of rapid recharge in all of the system. You see there's a cut. So this is actually <clears throat> the lines that are shown here. They go up maybe to two or two and a half percent while these are in the upper part of the y-axis scale. So they are rather in the 10, 20, 30, 40, 60 percent range. And to link this now with the contamination risk concerning different degradable pollutants, <clears throat> we compare them actually to real degradable pollutants. So we can do this actually with everything that decomposes and has a half lifetime for the unsaturated zone. Um, and we, for our example, we took three contaminants. One of them was salinomycin, which is a <coughs> pharmaceutical that is given mostly to porks. Um, I think it's um, um, something like an antibiotic. And this goes via manure to the fields and it has a um, half-life time, half -life time in the Vedo zone of around 10 days. Then something very prominent, which is glyphosate, which has in the Vedo zone, there are different estimates, but the most of them that I found it were around 25 days. <clears throat> and then we also used E. coli, which has a decomposition or half-life time of um, around 60 days. And then you can plot this on the line here, and you can actually see how much of the groundwater, uh, of the groundwater recharge would actually still have some of these pollutants included if you assume that they are transported conservatively. So it means they are not, um, they are not like um, absorbed in, in the matrix. But this is also realistic because concentrated um, recharge and cast, it can also bring particles. So even if glyphosate or salinomycin would be absorbed to some soil particles, if you look at a cast springs during high water, you can see a lot of turbidity because all of these um, sediments, they are flushed out of the spring. So whether it's particular transport or suspended transport actually doesn't make a big difference in the cast. Okay, so this was quite hypothetical. It was basically just a model experiment. So how can we bring this back to reality? Of course, with observations. Um, we found a nice survey of glyphosate concentrations in the United States, um, which is shown here. So um, first of all, we run the model with realistic glyphosate application rates. This we got from literature, so it was around 0 0.72 uh, to 4.32 kilograms per hectare per year. We again assumed a 20-day half-life time in the way the zone. <clears throat> and then running the model with that, over the entire simulation domain, we get more or less a remaining um, concentration of glyphosate in the groundwater of 0 point, uh, 1.91 to uh, plus minus 1.61 micrograms per liter. Now, if you look at what they found in the United States in carbonate rock regions, they found an average of 0 0.82 plus minus 1.74 in those locations where glyphosate was detected. So see, 93 locations they found glyphosate and it was yeah, a little bit more than 10% of those locations inside the carbonate rock aquifers. Comparing that to non-carbonate rock regions, in the observation sample, we could also find a very strong difference of glyphosate concentration inside and outside the cast, which is some sort like not a very strong evaluation because the model is not applied in the United States, but it gives us an idea that the model is actually not performing so bad in those um, to simulate the contamination risk. So overall, um, in my PhD and my postdoc, I showed that it's possible to even simulate to simulate even systems that are as complex as caste systems at larger scales, not by um, statistical upscaling approaches, but by transferring the right concept. And the right concept for the caste was that there is concentrated recharge and almost no surface runoff. That was a simple change to the model, but it um, resulted in superior performance compared to previously applied global models. <clears throat> the shortcuts by concentrated recharge of the groundwater, they enhance the recharge volumes. So they basically enhance the potentially available water for drinking water supply. But because of these fast flow paths, also pollutants can reach the subsurface much, much faster. And so the groundwater contamination risk in, is increased. So it means 
a good thing, a bad thing, more reason for research. So um, that is the end of my talk. I want to thank you for your attention. Gracias para su atención. I would like to also thank my um, team, which is shown here. So um, Agustin still knows Vera, but um, the other three, they are my PhDs and my postdoc. And of course, all my contribute, contributors and funding agencies, the German Research Foundation and the German Academic Exchange Service. All right, thanks a lot. And now I didn't forget, I turn off my shared screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Hartmann. Thank you too. Before starting the Q&A session, and while the audience finish typing their questions, I would like to remind all participants that this webinar will be available on our social media, so please make sure to follow us. So here's our social media. And also I'd like to announce our next seminars. Uh, since the poster signs are in Spanish and this will be held in Spanish, I'll, I'll do the announcement in Spanish. So sorry to our English speakers. El siguiente seminario será este viernes. Se titulará Modelación Hidroclimática para el Estudio de Inundaciones. Igual a las 10 horas como todos nuestros eh, seminarios regulares de viernes. Eh, será dado por la doctora Annie Pollin de la Escuela de Tecnología Superior de Montreal. El siguiente será el 20 de julio a la misma hora. Se titulará Asignación del agua en una frontera extractiva, definiendo la gobernanza disfuncional. Este será dado por la doctora María Cecilia Roa García de la Universidad de Los Andes. El siguiente es el que tienen en pantalla, julio 21, Microplásticos Ambientales, donde tendremos varios conferencistas. El siguiente será julio 22. Trazadores eh, hidrológicos útiles o gasto necesario del doctor Christian Birkel. El siguiente será el julio 29, el seminario, el primer seminario en línea, el primer coloquio, perdón, internacional de hidrología forestal. Tendremos cuatro conferencistas muy importantes: el doctor Vasquen Andresian, la doctora Catalina Segura, el doctor Hugo Gutiérrez Jurado y la doctora Julia Jones. También los queremos invitar al primer seminario virtual llamado Diáspora Hídrica, Jóvenes Mexicanos Explorando las Fronteras del Conocimiento del Agua. Este será del 3 al 7 de agosto. Los requisitos para participar están en su pantalla. Por favor, regístrense si, si cumplen con los requisitos. También ya está disponible la tercera edición de eh, nuestra revista, El Acueducto. Eh, si tienen interés, por favor, descárguenla en la página de internet que se muestra abajo en la pantalla, gov.mx diagonal INTA. Y también no se olviden de visitar en la misma página eh, nuestro blog llamado Perspectivas. Nuestro último artículo eh, es el que se ve en pantalla, un enfoque en el agua invisible. So now let's start with the questions. I'll, I'll read the questions to you and okay you yes i see that there are some questions in the chat so um i was asking how to proceed yeah them. yeah I, I will read them if it's easier for you it would be nice thank you yeah so the first two questions are related to water policy so the first question comes from the director of our institute adrian pedro sacuña he says, your large scale results show a general decrease in recharge, which may enhance the overexploitation of these systems. Mm -hmm. Given the less certainty in aquifers, which are more vulnerable due to the lack of data, could water managers use these results to prevent that extractions exceed the recharge in these areas? Um, I, of course, I hope not. Um, my local collaborators say, um, in, for example, in Spain, they work directly with the water authorities. So at the local scale, um, hydrogeologists are well aware about the enhanced um, water availability in their aquifers. So um, they, they would um, rather rely on these local aspects. Um, on the larger scale, um, if it goes to water policy um, <clears throat> um, information, I would say um, that these results give this indication that um, there is actually a huge potential in karst, um, which is um, by like shown by other colleagues, actually not um, completely used this, this yet, um, yet. 
So uh, at the moment, most of the cast water resources are being avoided by water um, managers because of the difficulties in managing the contamination risk. So um, of course, it might give some like reckless people the, um, some justification to over exploit those aquifers, but um, in fact, they might also um, find very quickly that they drain um, because they are so, so, so dynamic systems. So, um, and the good thing is um, they might also refill quite quickly so because they are usually not so large um, compared to um, these mega groundwater systems like in, let's say, the Nubian aquifer or in the, in the high plains in the United States. So, of course, there's a little risk that I hope um, um, that they might use this information. Don't read the paper properly because you say it's just potential more um, water availability but um, from my experience with the practitioners I know they would never rely on such a large-scale model they would rather rely on their local experience the large-scale model is rather interesting to find out hot spots and hot moments where we might not um, know that there might be problems in the future all right thank you very much our next question from Agustin He's asking, based on your results about contaminant transport, what type of water regulation should be implemented? Yeah, so that's the idealistic approach um, for that. So you could just declare um, <clears throat> the recharge areas of carbonate rock springs or carbonate rock aquifers, water protection zones. And <clears throat> this sounds very nice, but in many regions, um, farmers are already using these um, areas. And of course, they don't want to lose their land. So um, what I would suggest is a, more, a smarter um, management of agricultural um, fertilization, for example. So to maybe not use the most poisonous um, fertilizers or pesticides, but use something that is less, um, um, less unhealthy and to apply it at the right times. Because um, car system only become shortcuts for water if it's get, getting really wet. There might be hidden karst systems everywhere in carbonate rock regions where people think they are not karstified because there was not enough water yet to actually activate them. Maybe there was enough water in the past. So if you apply, um, if you have to apply fertilizers, you might apply them at times in the growing season at reasonable amounts so that the plants can use them and they are not flushed into the subsurface. Okay, thank you. Now I will read you two small questions to try to pack them and try to answer as many as possible. Yeah. The first one, is it possible to include the effects of above ground vegetation into the models? And the second one, they are asking if the model you develop, is it uh, open access or is a license, licensed product? Okay, so to the first question, we already tried to include vegetation. So we have a collaboration with Bristol University, another PhD student developed a better version of my model that explicitly accounts for different vegetation types with a better representation of um, transpiration processes and evaporation processes um, following the penman monteith approach. So we can actually um, differentiate whether there's different types of forests or grassland or shrubs. And we can actually also, be a, it's something ongoing, we can actually show that sometimes land use change um, um, actually is affecting groundwater recharge much stronger than predicted climatic change so that's a very like the competing um effects of these two processes um, that's what we want to do research on and we are developing methods for that and um, this method this model the further development and um, which includes vegetation processes and also the model that i showed today it's available on github um, um in matlab programming language so the question is yes or no you need a license for matlab but if you have a license for matlab you can download the code um, if you go to my webpage, we have a section like service or codes and data where we provide the links and the publication for that. And if you don't find something that you need, just write me an email. Usually we share everything that we have and we are developing more and more GitHub resources for that. Great, thank you. So we have two questions from Carlos Gutierrez. He's asking, what traces did you use in the plot scale model and how did you obtain the KX and KY parameters, the permeability parameters? Um, so the tracer was bromide that was applied there. Um, I didn't use the tracer, it was um, the experimental hydrogeologist that worked there. So in fact, I think part of a student field trip. So a lot of 
students were involved and two professors also from Haifa University in Israel. Um, the KY and the KX factors were actually not part of the model. It was a process-oriented model. So I actually had some parameters that um, conceptually represented the um, flow and transport processes in the model, um, which were calibrated with the inverse parameter estimation approach. Yeah, so yeah, so it was in inversely found. Thank you very much. Our next question from Ulysses. Based on your results, you have considered the effect of air pollutants, mainly aerosols that precipitate and infiltrate underground? Um, no, I did not. It's a very good idea, actually. Like when we finally have this paper accepted, it's still in review, and the reviews are, um, are some hard nuts because they want to have more observation data, which is difficult to obtain on the larger scale. We would like to try different pollutants, and we would also like to include more mechanistic transport routines and so we will try to look at all other pollutants as well but if we are not that far yet thank you our next question from adriana palma what about geochemical processes in the cars media yeah the most important one is of course the um, carbonate rock dissolution which is really interesting because you have the dissolution in the subsurface but then you have also the precipitation of carbonates in the caves which is used to um like uh, which builds these nice bilious teams so stalagmites and, and the flowstone which is used for poly climate reconstruction so um i i'm not working with these like with the there is some understanding on that already from previous research. I'm not working with this directly, but I'm working with a group that works with paleoclimate reconstruction in Sydney University. Those were the guys with the isotopic composition of drip water because they are interested how speedless themes grow and how they are composed and the composition, how it's influenced by the available water. So they use my model right now also for a study that looks at speedless theme growth in different caves all around the globe with the CSAL version 2 database, something like that. And, and they can also show just by seasonal variability of hydrology that, um, that the hydrologic controls on speleothem growth is quite substantial. So it's one of the most controlling factors um, apart from aridity. Because if there's no rain, there's also no hydrology. So um, that's why climate also has an impact. But the second strongest control is the um, groundwater recharge. So we are working with people that work on calcite dissolution and precipitation, um, but um, I myself, I only use hydrochemistry to um, get a better parameter estimation of my models. So I use conservative tracer, but not reactive tracers like nitrate, which can be considered conservative if you don't have too much agriculture and sulfate or chloride. Thank you. Our next question is again from Carlos Gutierrez. Could you model a high rain infiltration effect caused by a hurricane? Um, so can you repeat? Yeah, sure. Could you model a high rain infiltration effect caused by a hurricane? I, I, I saw it, but I, I, did, I didn't completely yeah. understand. I, but I saw the question um, written somewhere. Yeah, uh, 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 I can. Ah, by, by, oh, um, Okay, I'm like, of course, I don't have hurricanes in my, oh, well, I have one, but I didn't simulate it. We have our, one of our study sites is in Puerto Rico, which we built just before Maria came. And, and then we had um, Maria and the, the devices were fortunately not destroyed, just our climate station, which we fortunately could replace. Um, the interesting thing, we looked at the, the, the data and um, we had discharge in those in, in this um, car system and we had so much observation. And the interesting thing was that actually the discharge reaction wasn't so strong because the rainfall intensities was, weren't so bad. It was the wind that was really bad and maybe also the, like a lot of vegetation, like the entire forest was um, like partially, it fell on my climate station, but um, there was not some, so strong rainfall. If there was very strong rainfall events, I would say if the present structure, the model would at some point produce surface runoff. But since we did not have, do not have so many observation of super high intensity rainfall induced surface runoff, 
I would say these simulations are very uncertain, but we can, we, we did some virtual experiments with very high precipitation rates. So we can trigger the model to do that. And I would say at some point, even a cast system will overflow, but it depends on the degree of castification. And, and since we mostly work with some sort of inverse parameter estimation approaches, I would be very careful to trust my model. So I would say potentially yes, but um, highly uncertain. Thank you very much. Now from Monica P. Contaminants like salinomycin and glyphosate were found in research. I was wondering if you could also find some byproducts or intermediaries of these pollutants, or if you determine any toxicity parameter. Thank you very much. Yeah. So there's these two parts like salinomycin, I'm not such an expert for, so I actually, I, I, I would have to read the, the byproducts. I know that glyphosate is actually, it has a metabolite, which is called AMPA, and the long name, I don't know. Um, and we are looking at the database that I showed you for, um, for evaluation in the United States. We're also looking at this for AMPA, and we found some AMPA concentrations somewhere, and I would like to use them also to see if in those regions where my, um, where my model would suggest that there are longer transit times, that you actually find rather amper than the glyphosate as a decomposition product. What I think makes more sense because it's, the model does not really simulate the transport of these con, um, pollutants. It just simulates a hypothetical conservative tracer. I would rather go for this like toxicity, toxicity parameters, which has been done already at the catchment scale for cast system, which is just quantifying the fraction of water that comes through the fast flow paths. So basically these rapid recharge fractions are something like that. Or in my example that I showed with these two, like the two blocks, one of them with the conduit, the other one without the conduit, I, I quantified the volume of water that went through the conduit. So these, this is, you can simulate over a time period and you can define the times where you have the higher risk of contamination. And this can be predicted as well. So you can use something like that to um, support risk management of um, cast water supplies to tell them when they might have to increase their monitoring or their sampling frequency to prevent contaminants entering the, ground, uh, the water supply systems. Thank you. Our next question from Jorge. Which model do you recommend to use to study the contribution of pollutants from karstic areas to rivers and coastal areas? Um, I think that's a general question. Um, the, the model that you apply, it has to fulfill somehow the purpose. So if you want to, um, to simulate the contribution of pollutants to rivers and coastal areas, you have to have something that includes somehow transport. So that's uh, like a minimum boundary you need to have in your model. In terms of complexity, it depends on data availability. So like, like these two studies that I showed you, the plot scale model, um, at the plot scale, you might have already a lot of data or you might be able to spend some time and efforts to install devices and to get the data that you need to even apply a mechanistic spatially distributed model. If you want to go for a larger scale, let's say look at the entire carbonate rock coast of Mexico, you might not be able to, to get all the data that you need. So I would rather rely on very basic concept that might be something like these bucket type models you have to make sure that they get the, the fast transport right um, or um, some like some sort of um, like hybrid types that reflect spatial heterogeneity by some sort of distribution function like the models that I use they are somewhere between the bucket and the spatially distributed models so go I would say as complex as necessary in terms of what you need for your purpose and as parsimonious as possible in terms of um, available data all right, thank you very much. I think those are all the questions. I don't know if uh, you have some questions from the from the Facebook chat. I'm asking to my other colleagues. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think we have any questions from the Facebook chat. So uh, I think that was all for today. So uh, now let's go with Agustin Breña, head of the hydrology department for the closing remarks. Okay, thank Go you. Ahead, Agustin. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harman, for this uh, interesting talk. Um, so, um, for 
closing this uh, uh, webinar, I, I would like to point out that uh, um, the, the presentation displayed uh, today um, was um, um, an interesting one because uh, it shows basically that uh, recharge is, uh, can be uh, underestimated in many times and that uh, incorporating uh, other uh, 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 incorporating heterogeneity in the structure of the epic cards can, can lead to a, a substantial increase in recharge areas. And as uh, Dr. Harman point, pointed out, um, this, is, this can be both and good in terms of water management, because from one side, uh, karst aquifers can have more recharge than, uh, than what has been thought before. But on the other side, uh, the transport or the le leaching of uh, contaminants and uh, nutrients can um, also increase the risk of uh, contamination at the large scale. So um, uh, thank you, Dr. Harman, for this, uh, for your results, for your findings. And I, I, I hope that this, um, in the future, we can uh, collaborate um, for um, modeling and experimental work uh, here in Mexico if you if you if you like the idea I'm sure we, uh, much of our staff would be, would be interested to, to join the course. Uh, thank you again Dr. Harman and uh, it was a pleasure to host you uh, today. Thank you also for the invitation. It was a pleasure to have the discussion and to give the talk today. Thank you very much Agustin. That was all for today. Thank you very much Dr. Harman. Thanks to all our Zoom and Facebook viewers, we hope to see you again on our next webinars. Stay safe. Goodbye. Goodbye.